everybody. Thank you for joining us in another edition of State of Sound Stories. State of Sound Stories is a library's event in which we ask individuals and groups to share their creative paths that got them involved with sound. For more information about State of Sound Stories or the larger project of State of Sound in general, you can visit our website, which will be in the chat. There's gonna be designated time to ask questions to Ruby at the end, but please feel free to ask any and all questions during the interview. Same thing, just throw them in the chat. And without further ado, welcome Ruby Abara. How are you doing today? Hey, hi everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Hi, Alex. Thank you for inviting me to today's conversation. Um, I'm, I'm grateful and it's an honor to be in conversation with you. And like I, I was telling you prior to the event, I, I've been wanting to visit you know, North Carolina. I've never been to NC State before. So I'm glad we were able to make this event happen, even if it's virtually, but I'm good. Um, I'm here chilling live in my studio. How are you doing? I'm good. And we're definitely going to use this as the first of many. We'll hopefully bring you out here. We have a big street festival called Pacapalooza. G. Yamazawa has performed at it, and we can hopefully get you on one of those stages. And just in general, too, Raleigh is a great place with really awesome music venues downtown Raleigh. So we'll definitely, definitely be involved in getting you out here again. For those of you who might be new to Ruby, and I'm going to let you tell your story, Ruby, but to give some context, you're an artist, an activist, a scientist, MC, poet, director, and I'm sure the list could go on. You're originally from the Philippines and currently reside in the Bay Area. Basically, you're just an awesome individual. Um, I was introdu introduced to you in kind of an interesting way. I was back home in Santa Cruz, California, one random week, and I think it was a weekday. I looked at the venues around town and saw that at the Catalyst, Raekwon was performing. And so I decided to just buy a solo ticket and head out by myself. You, of all people, happened to be opening for him that night, and you did great. I was like, I need to check out this artist when I get home. But what really captivated me was the sound went out for your DJ. And the sound man in the booth and your DJ couldn't figure out what was going on. But before anybody could really notice what was happening and you like you didn't even miss a beat, you grabbed the mic and you spit an acapella verse or a freestyle. And I remember there being two old heads by the bar. They were just sitting down. You could tell they'd been to like the first hip hop show ever in the 80s and 90s. And they were kind of sipping, drinking a beer. I don't think they stood up for the whole night. And when you did that and you like got the crowd back to attention, um, they looked at each other and they kind of just nodded at each other like, oh, yeah, she's dope. Like, she's got it. And I thought that was yes. super cool. So to make a long story less long, it's an honor to have you. It's really great to finally meet you. That was so many years ago. Um, do you remember that performance, actually? I do remember that performance. That's actually um, one of the events that I've done where I hold it in high regard. I probably would put it in my top 10 performances I've ever done of all time. I think solely on the fact that I got to open for such a legend, you know, Raekwon, um, one of the artists like, I grew up listening to or, or groups rather um, and within hip hop was Wu-Tang. Wu-Tang, I always attribute, you know, them as uh, one of my inspirations, musical inspirations growing up. And one of my introductions to, to more uh, lyrical hip hop and, you know, come on, you can't, you can't deny how dope the Wu is. So um, that was an honor for me. Definitely. That's so awesome. And just to give the audience a little bit of context, Jason, can we play that first video from Ruby and her band? How do you say the, the name of your band? Uh, my band is called the Balik Bayans. Balik Bayans. And we're going to play three minutes of Someday. It's a submission that you had for the NPR Tiny Desk series. And they actually gave you a shout out um, and wrote up a whole article about this performance, correct? Yep. Very cool. So we're going to go ahead and play some of that. Jason, let us know when you're ready. Make this 
my girl. Miss, I'm finally here. A rapper talk less and take notes. We slay sheep, respect those who praise thee. But next, so take beats to flex, so finesse these to bless those. Say peace, say test, so we say peace, but stay woke. Leave you cat's face. To the point, I catch phrase rhymes, and the catch phrase till it's starts to cascade. Product of Mac Dre, Wu Tang, and Andre. Break beats from beat tips to break next to press play. They say we from the slums, but the heroes never run. But people always sung brown faces in the sun. Still the same on my tongue. Fuck the spinner from the station, some rotating around the sun. The axe is my mattress. I pass something past. Let's give a round of applause for Ruby. That video always just makes me so happy to see so many awesome people in one place. Can you tell us a little bit about your band and how that video came to be? Thank you for showcasing that. That's actually one of my uh, favorite performances that I've done with my band. Shout out again to, to my band, the Balik Bayans. So how we came to be was we formed in 2018. Um, I released the Circa 91 album, October of 2017. And so I, after the release, I was pretty much thrown into um, this, this cycle of nonstop touring and shows. Um, you know, I, I'm very, very grateful that the response of the album was, I received so much positive responses for it. And of course, you know, with that, it comes with, with a lot of events and a lot of shows and a lot of inquiries. And so I found myself performing uh, at the time with my DJ. And uh, I think that was actually one of the shows that, that you might have, you mentioned earlier uh, where we opened up for Raekwon. And after doing that for about six months, it got to a point where for me being the artist on stage, and of course, at that point, I was also the one who wrote the music, I, I recorded it. The music was already old pretty much by the time you released, you know, the record. And so it got very repetitive for me. And, and I started to think, how can I make these live shows not only for myself, but also for the people that are that have been coming out to watch these shows? How can I make them a little bit more interesting and bring a little a different dynamic than to what have people what people have heard on the record, the actual recording? And so I, I think I saw a performance or I went to a J. Cole concert and I remember um, when he was doing his tour for For Your Eyes Only, um, one during the set, I heard live drums and I heard guitars too, like they were um, accompanying the backing track. And I remember thinking to myself as I was watching it at, I think this was at um, Oakland Stadium, I was like, I would love to have that. I would love to incorporate that in my shows. And so I started to think about the musicians that I already was familiar with or that I had met, you know, um, previously um, throughout my um, my career as a, as a musician. And I realized that there's so many musicians that I had met along the way. Um, I kept my DJ that I was performing with and the vocalist and the guitar player, I've known them actually since I was in college at UC Davis. Um, we have Rocky G who plays the saxophone. I, I met him in San Francisco in an event. Um, my drummer Miko, I met him um, through a mutual friend and uh, Mons, our keyboard player. I met him at uh, a random event just a couple, couple months prior to us forming together officially. And um, Angelo, our bass player was, uh, uh, recommended by uh, Mons, our, our keyboard player. And so we, Eventually, we had this formation of eight individuals and um, we study the music together and we kind of deconstructed everything and see seeing how what elements can can we continue to, um, I guess, 
embellish or develop for, for the live stage. And at the same time, also we took a look at the music and see what, what kind of things could we improve or can we kind of remix for the live shows. And ever since then, um, you know, that was June 2018 where we first had our meeting. And since then we've done a multitude of shows together and it's just been such a wild ride. And I, I just want to quickly note too, um, for being a performer or specifically a rap performer working with a band, it's such a different experience. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I love that, you know, that, that one-on-one -on -one personal experience, but with being with a DJ on stage, I think nothing's ever really going to beat that because, you know, having the, the MC and the DJ that, that, that is pretty much, you know, it goes back to, to the early days of hip hop where, you know, you have um, your, the one person on the mic, one person on the, on the ones and twos. But for me, when it comes to performing with a band, I feel like it's complete and we're able to also deviate from the original recording, which makes it a lot more fun. That's awesome. And Jason was talking about this earlier. How do you find rehearsal space and rehearsal time in the Bay Area where it's so busy and space is so limited? How would you all come together and practice? And then did you find yourself taking on a conductor role? Would you, cause it's your music, it's you are the one who has it envisioned, you wrote it. Um, were you the ones that, one that had to put it all together with the band or were you able to incorporate some others in, in that process as well? So that's a good question. I think when it comes to rehearsals, um, I'm not gonna go on here in front and say that we have like this super fancy recording rehearsal space that you know that fits all of us um, spaciously. Um, it's honestly been, it's, it's, it's varied. It's dependent on who's available and what space is available. Sometimes you've had to practice at our drummer's a living room um, on a Saturday morning and you know worried that, okay, maybe we're not, hoping we're not too loud and his parents aren't gonna come out of the bedroom telling us to like shut up. And other times we find ourselves um, all chipping in uh, to, to rent a small uh, rehearsal space out here, either in Oakland or San Francisco. And even though we found ourselves at times we're just super cramped up, I could be literally right in front of my drummer and I feel like my eardrums are gonna pop. It's sometimes you, you kind of feel like, you know, you're in the moment and it's fun uh, just being able to vibe off of each other. So it really depends. Honestly, I feel like the best rehearsal spaces are the more intimate ones so that we feel more comfortable. And I think that we're able to also um, elevate our chemistry as, as a band, not only as um, as friends, but also as bandmates and learn how to play off of each other. And when it comes to uh, like, who is the musical conductor of the of the entire ensemble, it's honestly just been a collaborative effort the whole way through. But I do have to say that um, our bass player, um, Angelo and our keyboard player Mons has been stepping up to have been stepping up to the plate from the beginning. And they've kind of helped take on the role of musical directors because um, they have such a, a you know, a big background knowledge on um, reading musical notes and how to um, translate, um, I guess, notes from keyboard to, to saxophone. And I'm just very blessed that so many of them are knowledgeable and experts in their own craft. So I, I definitely want to give them the space. I've been wanting to give them the space to, to um, also bring their own flavor. Because at the end of the day, even though we've been playing, you know, my music and um, the Circa 91 record, I still think that when it comes to live shows, it's, it's a collaboration. It's not about who's the lead singer. It's not about who's, who has the microphone. For example, if one person is offbeat, that throws off the rest of us. So we always need to work in tandem. Definitely. I love rehearsal stories because it's kind of like a behind the scenes look into some of your favorite bands. I remember watching the Marley documentary when they were young and they were getting ready to perform live for the first couple of times, they were all really nervous. And so their guru, Scratch Perry, would take them to the cemetery in the middle of the night and they would perform at the cemetery. They're very spiritual people. So they were overcoming the spirits, but also oh, if wow. you can perform live at a cemetery, then going in front of people, there's no problem anymore. So do you have any stories about overcoming nerves for, from any of your bandmates or when you were first performing with your DJ, how did you get comfortable being in front of an audience? Um, to be honest with you, I, I don't think I would ever be able to perform at a cemetery. I'm I actually <laughs> I'm one of those uh, people who I come across as, um, you know, the, the certain persona on stage. But I'm, I get scared of a, of a lot of things. I would probably you know, I, I wouldn't even be able to remember my verse if, if you told me to perform at a cemetery tonight. But so um, for me, though, in terms of uh, my own experiences in times of nervousness, 
one experience that comes to mind was when me and my band, we visited the Philippines March of 2019. And um, the whole reason why we took out this, we took this trip to the Philippines was we were invited to perform at this music festival called the Malasimbo Festival in uh, Puerto Galera, Philippines. And it's this two-day festival, which I, I, I guess for lack of better words and to kind of be more concise with, I guess, the description of it, it's kind of like the um, Coachella of the Philippines where they invite all of these artists from around the world and they perform in this one location. It's, and it's such a beautiful place too. You have palm trees, it's in the middle of a beach. And so we get there um, the morning of our first night. We're performing both Friday and Saturday night. We arrive Friday morning. And so far, everything's been running smoothly. We get to the stage um, and we're, we start to set up while the, perf the act before us is finishing up their set. And we think everything's still going good. And right when um, you know, we, we turn on the, the, the amps and everything, no sound is coming out at all. And uh, I remember like we were there, this is our first night in the Philippines. We've never traveled internationally together before. And um, I remember just turning to my left and my right and you can quickly see everybody's face, just like the, this whole new like um, energy just took over everybody and everybody looks so nervous. And it took us about 30 minutes to even get our sound straight. And I, I feel like those 30 minutes felt like six hours it was just because um we were constantly you know wondering in the back of our heads how are we gonna perform this is only day one in the philippines um we're already off to a bad start um even my dj no sound was coming out of his laptop so i thought how what am i gonna do at this music festival am i gonna just be here to spit some spoken word like are people even gonna vibe out to hearing a cappella at a big music festival people are expecting a light show people are expecting a big sound and thankfully, you know, everybody kept their, their nerves calm, though. I think, you know, in moments like that, it reminds me that when things aren't going um, necessarily as planned, you have to learn how to adjust and you learn how you have to learn how to pivot. And so, you know, we, we did um, we kind of came up with a backup plan where I was just going to um, rap with my DJ if we could get at least his equipment going and we could um, reserve the, the, the band set up for the following day. But thankfully, you know, the, the angels were on our side that night and everything started to work. Um, but yeah, in terms of overcoming nervousness, um, for me, I'm probably the worst person to give this advice because I can say for, for my experience that it hasn't gotten any better. I still get nervous to this day. I still get butterflies. I still get those sweaty palms every time I get on stage. But honestly, I feel like that that for me is a good feeling to have because it reminds me that I still am passionate and I still care about what I what I do. And I still, you know, I, I still give a damn about what I'm doing and I, I love what I'm doing. And so when it comes to, you know, performances, I think as long as I can get the first word out, it's it's just it's autopilot from there and the adrenaline rush, you know, nothing, nothing beats a live performance. Definitely. I think when they say when the butterflies are gone, it might be time to hang it up. And that's that's really cool. I imagine that pitfall feeling of when no sound is coming out. You done flew halfway across <laughs> the world and people are waiting anxiously. They're all looking up at you and nothing's coming out. Uh, what a wild feeling. What a wild ride. You mentioned the Philippines. Uh, do you mind if we go back? You've talked about your story um, coming to America in your in your first album, in your mom's story. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how music played a role in your early life? Oh, absolutely. So I was born in Tacloban City, Philippines. Um, my family and I, we immigrated to the Bay Area in the 90s. And I've grown up um, in the East Bay ever since, um, in, in like the, the Hayward area, Hayward, San Lorenzo area. And I remember when I first got to the U.S., you know, it was such a dramatic shift um, in settings, surroundings, um, lifestyle, culture, and of course, language. I think language barrier was one of the, the, the biggest roadblocks, especially for my parents who, who were already well into their 30s at the, at the time that we came here. And so it was a completely, it was completely different lifestyle than everything I had known back in the Philippines, you know, for most of my childhood and even up until my adulthood, um, I never felt Filipino enough or never felt American enough as I was growing up here. And so having, you know, this kind of confusion around my identity, I think that also um, added to or contributed to me wanting to um, kind of reconnect with uh, my Filipino culture. And so I found myself, even though we were already living here in, in California, I found myself, um, you know, actively looking up artists on, on online and trying to see, um, trying to find out what, what, what does Tagalog rap sound like? What does Tagalog music sound like? 
also um, being hungry for watching Filipino films. Um, I never lost, you know, that that part of the culture um, for me. And my, my parents also always made it a point that we when we were at home, we spoke in our native language. And so um, I never felt too far from home, even though, you know, we were 7000 miles away. And when it came to music, I found myself very lucky that out of all places in the U.S., it was the Bay Area that we just, that my family um, decided to, to immigrate at. And the reason for that is um, for, for the folks that have been to the Bay Area, it's, it's just this large melting pot, not only of cultures, but also of music. Um, you know, here in the Bay, um, you know, we have everything from rock. I mean, Green Day, you know, came came from um, from out here um, to Tupac and hieroglyphics. And so, you know, growing up, I had such a diverse um, library of sounds that I was introduced to. And one of those artists um, that I was, one of the artists that I, I first learned about when I, when I was out here growing up was um, people like Tupac and um, also Snoop, like Snoop and Tupac were big in the nineties. And so, you know, being introduced, introduced to them at an early age, um, I couldn't be more thankful that it was artists like them because I felt I feel like at the end of the day, those artists are now reflected in my music and the type of sound I want to create and also the storytelling that I want to accomplish in, in my music. That's amazing. I have a similar story. I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, which is about two hours south of San Francisco, depending how fast you drive over the hill. And I found out later in life that I was actually quarter Filipino. My mom was raised in Vietnam um, and immigrated to Santa Cruz after the war, but found out, uh, she told me later, she was raised Vietnamese, her mom speaks Vietnamese culturally, food, music, everything, uh, movies, Vietnamese. But her dad was actually Filipino. My mom's dad was Filipino. And it was during the war and after the war ended, he had to go back to the Philippines, wanted to bring my grandma and my mom, but, they were so Vietnamese that they were like, we can't leave our family. You know, we, we're, we're trying to get to America. Um, but I know that in Santa Cruz, there wasn't as many Filipino people, but it was still kind of like around. And then when I moved to San Francisco to see the DJ Cuberts and, and the Invisible Scratch Pickles and the Five Lady Venoms, who are awesome Filipino DJs, and just seeing all the music and like how they embraced the culture was really, really awesome for me as well. Just so happy that I was able to experience that and recommend it for everybody out there to take a trip for sure. Um, when did you start playing with music on your um, own and creating music? It, I honestly, it, it started at an early age. I know for a lot of people who do both spoken word and rap that um, what I've found with my friends who do that, who do both art forms is that they usually start off as a spoken word artist first and they transition into, um, you know, delving into music. For me, it was actually the opposite. I started off off the bat, you know, writing raps and um, recording them. And so the story for that is probably, I would say the sixth, around the sixth grade, I remember saving up my lunch money for nearly an entire school year. Um, I, I think I was allotted like three bucks a day I would just you know I'd be like okay my diet for the next six months is going to be hot Cheetos and flavored water that's that's it because I need to save up for this microphone I need to be able to record my own stuff and so after six months later I asked my mom like can, can we can we go to the record store and I picked out like the cheapest dynamic microphone I could find I think I eventually saved up a little over a hundred dollars um, I took that home plugged it into the back of my computer and, you know, really from there, the rest was history. Um, I, I found myself as an independent artist. Um, and I think a lot of the growth and a lot of um, me evolving um, came from me just experimenting with different sounds and um, different ways of writing in, in my home studio. As, as you guys can see here today, like this is my home studio now. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to, to build it along the way and to add, finally get the equipment that I need. But I, I, I definitely, I started at around sixth grade. Um, I would write raps all day long in the back of class. And then eventually I got enough nerves to, to perform it live. I think it was uh, my sophomore year of high school. So a couple of years later, um, I was in a drama class my sophomore year. And the last project for that semester was to perform in front of the class, either a poem that was one of your favorite poems or a piece that you wrote yourself. And I actually ended up performing my very first um, rap that I had ever written. And it was about my family. 
And I just can't describe, you know, the, the, the feeling that I felt once I got off stage. It was not, nothing I had ever felt prior to that, that felt, you know, that, that adrenaline rush. And also that the sense of, the sense of pride and the sense of celebration and um, I feeling like I was in front of people and I put myself in a vulnerable place and people got to see me for who I really was. And so it gave me this sense of authority on my own story, but also a sense of freedom and being able to finally speak out. And so what, you know, at the end of the day, what I think rap and um, writing has offered to me is that it's given me a voice. And, um, you know, ever since then, I, I, I guess you guys, you, People can't shut me up anymore. <laughs> Beautiful. We have a great question in the chat. Um, they say, hi, I really love your music. Any advice on gaining exposure and momentum as a new Filipino American artist? They're releasing a debut single soon and they want to make music more than just a hobby. So I guess, how do you take it that next step? That's an amazing question. Um, for the for the person who wrote that, definitely hit, hit me up on IG later. Send me your link and... Let's promote that single when it comes out. Uh, for me, um, the, the advice that I can give for someone wanting to take their, especially their artistry to the next level is first to invest in yourself. Um, and what I mean by investing in yourself, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know, you're gonna pay thousands of dollars to, to be an opening act for a show, but something as simple as like what I did, um, buying my microphone, saving up for it, um, or, you know, getting the equipment you need, or maybe paying for production if you, if you want uh, better production for your music or for your, for your recording as well. Um, because I think ultimately, if you don't invest in yourself, who will, right? Um, you need to be able to, um, if, if you invest in yourself, I think that's going to, you know, further develop your career. Um, and on top of that, honestly, um, as redundant as this might sound or as cliche as it may sound, practice. Practice like tomorrow is going to be your biggest gig. For me, I, I spent so many years, you know, wondering like, when am I going to get this a viral video out? When is someone going to finally notice me? When am I going to get signed? You know, these questions I'm sure uh, always uh, get brought up in a lot of artists' head. And sometimes we get kind of lost in the mix of things, especially with social media and the fact that, you know, there's uh, likes visible and amount of views that are visible and we get caught up in this numbers game. But I think ultimately what, what's important is that you respect and you own your craft and you you truly know um, that, you know, wanting to be better, wanting to be a better artist today than you were yesterday, that should be at the priority of the, that should be at the top of your list. Because when the opportunity does come knocking at your door, you need to be prepared. And for me, you know, there's been times where I had to, uh, uh, an opportunity came up and I had to record a verse within two hours because it was for this big feature or I had to um, land um, or, or travel to New York um, to be part of a commercial. And um, I had to write and record my verse right then and there and memorize it and lip sync it this is the very same day. You know, when, when, when bigger opportunities like that start to happen, trust me, all those moments that you practice and you rehearsed, it, it, will, have, um, it, it will have paid off because now you're ready. Yeah, this is such a, it can be such a fast paced industry that if if you're not ready, it might take a, a while for that next opportunity to come. But if you knock that opportunity out out of the out of the park, there might be another one the next week, the next month. And this is perfect timing, perfect transition. Speaking of viral, one of your videos, us just hit a million views not too long ago Woo! on YouTube. And it looks like it's going to keep going to two million because it's moving really fast. Jason, can we play about three minutes of the Us video?
Ay. nothing on us. Ay. It's on box up. Yo, fuck a story arc if it don't involve no matriarch. Some mothers work on the ground up, they craft an air like ATR with the butterfly sleeves. Kaka Philippine blan, na pagdag salita mga bana tay bala. Wag magtaka kung ako ay makata bulok na sistema ko ra ko sa pera bagsak. But we put in our heart into darkness. They put in these pics in the office. Oh, you thinking you're schooling, but you hella lost 'cause you best see the boss while I top this. But look at my eyes, she moving so cold. Can't hold a candle to her when she glow. Flick at the wrist with that yellow she hold. But now goes the yellow. She dripping in gold. We pulling up in a jeepney. All of my soldiers greet me. Hand me bandanas and pull back my hammer. It's warfare when you see me. Skin you alive for my country. I live and die for my country. I kill a pig in a white hooded suit on the low for my country. They got evil plans in the devil's hands, but I don't pray 'cause I organize. They got new ways to impose strength, but I teach mine how to mobilize. We don't fight for the money, for the greedy, for the white man. All we want is our freedom and the right to live on our motherland. Island woman dies. Walang makakatigil. Brown brown woman rise. Alamin ang yung ugat. They got nothing on us. Nothing on us. Nothing on us. Nothing on us. Island woman rise. Walang makakatigil. Brown brown woman rise. Alamin ang yung ugat. They got nothing on us. Nothing on us. Nothing on us. It's some baksa. God is of guerrilla warfare in every lifetime. We don't take no shit except the oppressor's lifeline. If you step out of your line, I will protect what's mine. Kahit meron ro sa iyo, sino magdilikas sa iyo? Puro dugo, pumput ulo, mulat sa dagat, ang gumo to. We're claiming what's ours, the high and the low. These women are gods, you already know. We're deeper than water, the run in a village, the river runs red. You'll be dead in a minute, like never for nine. Just have you be headed? Fuck with my tribe, quickly regret. Ang niko sa kamay, ang isang mikro. Pono sa bay at ang tapang ko kaya nanginay at halimaw nang sumasabay mga baran yon lahat sa blay mga rappers na puro bangkay tinamaan ko lahat patay kaya walang magiingay I got that Filipino phenotype kayo maging mestizo white but give me that Moreno like that Rufy or Aquino type my lola stay be speaking like those Bali songs and Bolo knife again just a, another awesome amazing inspiring video and song Um, start us from the beginning. When did it? How long did the song? Was the song in your mind? When did it come to paper? And I know it was on your it was on your album. And when did you know that we're gonna make a video for this? But not only we're gonna make a video for this, we're gonna we're gonna do it in the in my vision, the way we the way I see it. So this us track, this us song has changed my life completely, um, and it's obviously you know one of my favorite songs that I've ever done. And first and foremost. Just the fact that I got to collaborate with you know three amazing talented women you know shout out to Faith Santilia shout out to Rocky Rivera shout out to Classy they completely knocked it out of the park you know with their verses and I feel like if the collaboration hadn't happened or if it wasn't with these three amazing women that it it wouldn't be the quality that it is um, today um, when it came to the song so when I was working on circa ninety one. I I kind of knew midway through. Um, I, I discovered that okay, I have a theme. Um, the theme is going to be my immigration story and also my my family's immigration story, and how us as us as Filipino Americans how we navigated the spaces here in America. And I remember you know thinking about okay if if I if I break up the 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 immigration story. Um, I had one song about colorism. I needed to have a track about colorism because I, I feel like that is a discussion that um, needs to be had, especially in the Filipino American community. You know where uh, skin whitening lotions is still prevalent, and um, you know a lot of this this media and this mentality about us having to um, you know uh, abide by um, Eurocentric uh, features and you know wanting to look a certain way. I, I felt I feel like there this been long over to overdue to have a discussion around that and to dismantle that. Um, and on top of that, I knew I had ne- I needed to have a track around um, language as well. So I I definitely wanted to incorporate different languages in the circa ninety one record. But um, another thing that I wanted to discuss was how patriarchal um, Filipino culture has always been. You know, whether it's through religion or even just through society, um, it's it's been you know it's very it's kind of commonplace for for women to be in the back. Background and to be subservient to men, and so I knew that if I was going to be talking about my immigration story, specifically talking about it in the scope of a Filipino American immigrant experience, I needed to talk about a patriarchy and what it meant for me. For me, growing up 
where I grew up in a matriarchal household. I grew up in a single parent household. I was raised by my mom and eventually my grandma moved in with us. And so for me growing up, I had these two examples of these two strong, independent women. And I remember growing up as a kid, um, you know, a lot of, you know, my beliefs were uh, kind of contradicted by what I saw in Philippines media, where on one hand, in my household, I saw the women would, were in charge. But then when it came to things like uh, mainstream media, I saw it was the men who, who were in charge. And so, you know, with, with these feelings of confusion, um, I, I knew I needed to kind of explore that topic. Um, and for me, it, there was just no way that I wasn't gonna have a lot of female voices on my debut album. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that people knew that, you know, my, my beliefs, um, my stances on a lot of social issues, whether it's on, you know, racism or issues surrounding gender that, that I also made sure to, to make that known in, in my lyrics and spe specifically in this album. And so when it came to me, um, you know, setting aside one track, talking about um, women empowerment and celebrating sisterhood, it took me months to find the perfect beat. I remember I, I pretty much already had the idea for um, who I wanted to, to feature on the track. Um, I, I kind of had an idea of the, the things I would talk about in my verses, but I didn't have a beat to write to yet. Um, we even came up, I, I we had a draft for uh, an Us version one. It was a completely different hook, completely uh, different beat. And it just didn't feel right. I, I feel like it wasn't um, one, uh, in your face enough. It wasn't uncompromising enough. It wasn't angry enough. I knew it needed to be militant music at the end of the day. And um, I remember it was just about, I think we had two months left or two or three months left before the album needed to come out in October. And um, I happened to be at the Beat Rock Music Studios uh, in uh, Los Angeles. And um, my recording engineer, uh, Fat Gums, he, he went to step outside to take a quick lunch break. And I opened up one of the folders on, on the desk desktop, uh, me being super nosy, I opened up the folder that said uh, Beats for Bamboo. And I remember I, I, I was clicking through them. I'm like, oh, th these are pretty dope. And then I think it was like track number 10. It was the beat for us. I was like, oh my God. I remember sitting there in the studio um, because he had the, the the subwoofers on, the, the whole, all, all the speakers were lit up. And I really felt like the rumble of the bass and just like when that first, like, oof, like the, the first 808 comes through, I was like, oh my God, this is the perfect beat. This is what we need. I remember sitting there in that studio that afternoon and I wrote my, my two verses right then and there. Um, I was already conceptualizing the music video as well. And to take a, to take a step back, I'm um, speaking about the video. I actually conceptualize the video before I finished my verses. Like I knew the video had to feature, um, you know, certain dance elements to feature the past and the present for, for Filipinas. And uh, that's why I incorporated those lines in uh, in the verse where I say, um, Pandango sa ilaw, she dripping in gold. Pandango sa ilaw is a, is a dance in Filipino culture where uh, it's predominantly women and they hold uh, these candle, it's a candle dance. And, um, you know, having that imagery already in my head and, and translating that into the lyrics, I knew that eventually I'd have to, you know, um, make this come to life in, in, in some sort of way. And so, when, you know, a couple months later after the album had been out, I, know, I knew that people uh, were waiting for the video for us. So we started filming the US video February of 2018. So Circa 91 came out October of 2017. So when February 2018 came around, I remember I posted a tweet on Twitter and I, at the time I had been um, super inspired by a lot of the videos that Beyonce had come out with, um, you know, with uh, Formation and the, the whole video project that she did for Lemonade. Um, it was very uh, female centric and also had a lot of, um, you know, her, her, her sisters in the video, you know, it was very um, strong female lead in it. And I wanted something like that too. I wanted something that would look and feel like authentically feel like, a community collaborative effort. And so I remember, you know, when I sent out that tweet, I, I told people, I want a video scene where I have at least 100 Filipinas in the same room. And I said, if you want to be part of this, meet us at Balboa High School in San Francisco this Saturday. Three days later, I get to the video shoot. I hadn't even started filming my own scenes yet. People were already starting to check in and ask, you know, where, where should they meet for the, for the cameo scene? And 11 a.m. comes around and we're getting ready to shoot the big, that, that, that room scene that I'm talking about. And we had, not only did we have 100, you know, Filipinas show up, but I think we had a little over 200 show up from all different backgrounds, all different, 
all different age groups. And it was just, you know, so, so beautiful for me to see that people were, people felt the urge to come out and not only to support this, but to feel like they wanted to be part of something like this. And to me, that's telling that projects like this, it's very far and few in between where we feel like um, something is made just for us and something is made that represent represents us as well, where we're in the forefront and um, we're in front of the camera. And, you know, ultimately, um, Alex, what I'm hoping to accomplish, not in just the past videos that I've done, but in the future videos that I'm working on for my sophomore album, is to, to normalize to normalize these faces, to, to make sure that, you know, when people watch these videos that they feel like not only are they represented and visible, but they feel like they can go out and do a video like that on their own to um, somewhere down the road. And I think ultimately as an artist, the, the biggest goal that you can achieve is to inspire other people. And truly that's, that's all that we were trying to do, um, you know, with me and um, the other women that were on the track or with uh, the DPs that helped with the music video as well. That's what we were trying to do. We were trying to make something that would, last longer than us and that would inspire and plant the seed for the next generations. That is amazing. And I'm going to go back and watch the video now that I've heard it from your lens, because I'm already putting like the, the really cool car shots with the traditional dance with just the black background. Um, and that that contrast between the two of them is just beautiful. And thank you for that. And thank you for empowering the Filipino community in the Bay Area, because you're right. It seems like something like this would have happened. But then you see the need for something when it does happen and you see the response afterwards when it's making its way, not just in the Bay Area, but worldwide and people are finding it. I saw people were doing TikTok dances to it recently, I think from the Philippines. And I actually remember I was following you on Instagram at the time. I remember seeing you call out for the people to come out and just kind of throw feelers out there. You're shooting a music video. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then to see it this many years later where people are, it's making its rounds and it's just gonna go further and further. So congratulations again on that. And thank you for thank doing you. that as well. Um, what was, what were some things that you learned in the directorial process of that? Is that the first music video that you were like the director for? Um, yeah, and I know you mentioned the DPs. Yeah. So what were some things that you learned and what are some things you're excited for the next music video? What I learned um, for, for that, that was, that, yeah, that was my directorial debut for uh, directing music videos. And I think, I mean, first and foremost, I need to say for if anyone that's tuned in right now is a director or a DP, anyone involved with film at all, hats off to you, like mad respect. Like that is such um, a big, big, big role with so much responsibility. And um, I think coming into that, I hadn't, I, I, I wasn't fully aware of how organized I needed to be because we had um, a lot of shoots or a lot of different scenes that we needed to knock out. Um, we filmed the US video in two days, but I still felt like we were crunched on time. Like we constantly had to keep shooting. Um, otherwise, you know, we didn't, we, we wanted to utilize everybody's time and we didn't want to, um, we wanted to be mindful of that and be respectful as well. And so when it came to, to directing it, um, first, what, what I did was for the US video, um, I, I gathered some references. Um, you know, I mentioned Beyonce earlier. Another reference for that video also was um, MIA, watching a lot of MIA videos because a lot of her, her visuals have always um, centered around women as well. And, um, you know, celebrating sisterhood and having um, a, just a group of women together in, in one video and, and celebrating together. And um, when, it, when it came to um, storyboarding that, I also had to be, uh, specific in, you know, specifically like which which parts do I want to um, showcase the more traditional scenes versus um, the more um, modern scenes like with the car. And I think ultimately what I what I decided on was to have an equal balance of that. And that that only not not doesn't represent the past and the present, but also for me was a metaphor of how women shouldn't be confined to look or behave a certain way that we shouldn't feel like we, we should be more feminine than masculine that, um, you know, we're both both sides and both both, um, you know, uh, attitudes are are completely open for, for for everyone. And and so for me, um, you know, when it came to editing the video, I worked closely with the DPs and, and the editor of it. What I actually did was I had this um, long ongoing spreadsheet 
where every every two minutes of the video, I had a timestamp for every, I'm not two minutes, sorry, every three seconds of the video, I had a timestamp. And I specifically um, would kind of, uh, I gathered this list and I would tell the, the editor, okay, for this, for between 25 seconds to 28 seconds, I want you to use this footage from this file. And this is the timestamp from that file. So it was a lot of like just going back and forth. Um, but I, I was very fortunate that, you know, shot out to Dale from Burgundy Suite. They're from San Jose. Um, they're very, very open for, for me to kind of take the reins on that on that project. And you know, they allowed me to have the creative freedom in the space to to guide to guide the team and to direct it in the way that I envisioned it. And I think oftentimes, you know, when it's a collaborative effort, especially, you know, not only doing it for the first time, but also being in a women where in a field um, it's not historically, um, you know female dominant. Um, I, I, I respected that about Dale and Burgundy Suite where they, they gave me the space to kind of just do my thing without, um, you know, questioning my ideas. It was just like, okay, tell us what to do and we're going to make it happen. So, you know, sh again, shout out to Burgundy Suite. And again, shout out to everyone that was involved too, because, um, you know, what with the US video, what I'm so proud of is that it was people who donated not only their time, but people who, who donated their talents. Um, everything that you see in that video from the dancers to, to, the, to the beautiful clothing that were worn, they were all donated. And it was people who believed in the project, who wanted to be part of it, that they were, um, they were so gracious and um, allowed, allowed us to, to receive their contributions. Definitely. You're getting a lot of love in the chat. The Filipino American group at NC State loves you. They, they thank you for empowering the Filipinx community. Um, shout out to the Filipino group. And by the way, shout out to Christiana. I see your, your tweet on Twitter. Shout out. Definitely. And I just want to give a quick plug. The libraries, for anybody who's interested in video editing, we have a digital media lab that's going to be opening once it's all safe, where there's a green screen, there's a 4K camera in there. You can rent out DSLR cameras from the Ask Us desk. So come come to the libraries if you're interested in video editing or if you already know how to video edit, you just need some equipment. We got stabilizers, camera kits, all that good stuff at the libraries. And yeah, come check this out. So you said that that changed your life. What, what opportunities came knocking after that Us video started making its rounds? So for the, the US video in particular, it's led me to performing at places like the Smithsonian or the Getty Museum Center or um, other, other film projects that are currently under wraps that I, I can't specifically talk about, but are coming soon. And it's just, it's elevated my career. And I also, um, I think, you know, it increased my visibility where now, um, you know, I, I've set foot on stages. Uh, I've set foot on sets that I would have only dreamed of you know being a part of and um again um you know i, I want to i want to stress over and over again that that us video was a collaborative effort had it not been for all of the people that showed up in the video or my collaborators on the track like that everyone was essential in making that happen and also um, i wanted to talk about um just the circa 91 record as a whole that also cha has changed my life. And it, it, for the people that are probably wondering how come I haven't released me, me, a new album since 2017 is because the, the project has kept me busy. Um, it's been it's brought to my plate so many different um, shows and events. And on top of that, um, I think it was January of 2018. The album had just been out for three months. Um, I, I got an email, um, you know, in that during that winter time, and that email was asking me to be part of this Mastercard commercial uh, with uh, R&B singer SZA, and uh, it was part of a campaign for the Super Bowl of that year and also the Grammy Awards. So that you know, the the, the commercial was on rotation on, on TV. And again, had it not been for that record, I would have they would have never known who I was, and I. I, I, I say that to, to mention or to point out that um, every everything that you release, big or small, um, you can literally you know set up a webcam for the artists that are tuned in right now. You can set up a webcam in your room and um, spit a freestyle. You never know who's gonna come across. Um, who you never know who's gonna come across it. You never know who's gonna watch it. Whose ears it's gonna land on. And so that's why I also want to kind of. Um, refer back to the question previously of um, advice for upcoming artists is to keep going, keep putting out as much material as you can, especially nowadays where, 
we're in a time where everything is social media based. I, I feel like in a way we've eliminated the middleman of, um, you know, getting our foot through the door where now if you upload something on the internet, that's that's your demo tape. That's your audition. That's your that, that that's that's your 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 um, way through the door. And so you, you, know, you I'm just sharing this story to, to tell everyone like you just never know who's going to listen to your music on Spotify. And, you know, the more volume and more work that you put out, um, the more that it's going to um, eventually lead to, to bigger and better opportunities. Definitely. We could talk for an hour about the corporate side of like MasterCard and working with them and what that was like. But I do, I was doing some research and I saw that you work at a biotech company. You're working on making vaccine or not um, helping COVID, creating COVID kits. The company's also working on trying to help with the vaccine. How did you balance academics and being an independent artist at the same time? That's a really good question because it's not lost on me that so many people are, you know, doing this balancing act, juggling act on a daily basis. Um, it's not just artists, it's everyone, especially I feel like people who who are immigrants. Um, that is that's what happens when when you migrate to a, a, a different country. So you have to learn how to wear you know, different hats and um, you you have this responsibility of different roles, whether it's with your family or you're juggling two jobs at the same time. For me, just like everyone else, um, you know, balancing my music and balancing my my daytime job as a scientist has never been easy. Um, for for one, uh, the biggest challenge, of course, has always been time management. Um, there's been times where I'm at work. I, I work a full time job. I work nine to five, um, regular nine to five shift. And I find myself having to sneak out of the lab and hop into my car to do an interview some days or um, to go home during lunch just to record a verse because I got to submit that song by the end of the day. So just small things like that where I kind of feel like um, if only time was on my side, if I if there was another me, I'd be able to do both things at once. But I think ultimately what last year has shown me is the importance also of my day, my day job. So I grew up being a big, 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 big um, nerd. Um, I was uh, fascinated with science at an early age. Um, again, you know, growing up in the 90s, um, I remember watching Bill Nye, the science guy on TV. And for, for me and my generation, he made, you know, science more accessible, like in terms of learning, you know, that subject more accessible to learn. And he did it in a way that was creative. And I think he's one of the people that um, actually opened up my interest to science um, early on. And I was just, you know, a very curious kid. I, I was, I always wondered why things worked the way they did, um, why, you know, certain things behaved the way they did and what was the reasoning for, for a lot of those things. And um, for me, you know, things like chemistry, biology and physics um, gave me answers to, to a lot of the things that I was wondering. And so I attended uh, UC Davis for college and I ended up majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology while I was there. And straight out of college, I went, I directly got a job, which is the same job that I'm working at now. And um, I, I work as a, a scientist at, a, a, at our quality control department. So I do uh, DNA testing um, every day, all day. And um, what last year taught me in 2020 was how important um, this career was. I think for, for the last couple of years, I kind of saw my career as a way for me, again, to invest in myself. Um, whatever money I would earn from my day job, I would use that as capital to, to buy a, a new computer or to buy a new microphone, to buy some speakers or to pay for a flight for a gig that necessarily didn't have budget to find me out. And, um, you know, last year, I think it gave me a different perspective in that um, it, it's not just music that can create change, but every everybody's day jobs, you know, every, what everybody what everybody does in society, we're we're all helping, you know, make the world go around. And um, especially for the frontliners, by the way, shout out to all the the, the nurses and the doctors. If it, there's any nurses or doctors tuned in, um, yeah. With 2020, things got a lot busier, and uh, my company helped uh, to. Re helped in research towards the, the COVID test kits and now also the vaccine. And I, I just saw myself having a, a different appreciation now for the type of work that we do at my day job and, and seeing that, you know, this is, again, it, it's, it's, a, it's a community effort um, for us to get out of this pandemic. It's going to take um, researchers from around the world and companies like mine to, to do their part. Definitely. Jason and I are really big proponents of 
you can have a nine to five and be a creative at the same time. That doesn't make it easy. <laughs> You're gonna have to figure out time management and balancing, but it does alleviate some of the stress of, do I have to take this path or this path? You can manage both. Um, and sometimes it's kind of freeing because it can be your escape from your nine to five, can be your music. And then your escape from the creative world, which is which can, can be a little all over the place and hectic um, to have a stable nine to five where you know you're gonna get a check coming in or, and you're helping out and you're in something that you're interested in. So I just wanna encourage all the students out there, like you can you can graduate with your degree and be creative at the same time. It's a it's a great way to kind of find that balance between the two. And we're I'm glad running- that you mentioned that, Alex. Yeah. Like it's Go definitely ahead. important, especially for the students tuned in. Um, I wanna quickly say that don't feel like you need to choose a certain path. If you have multiple interests like me, you know, I, I like both science and music. You, you can do both. But um, I also want to give a reminder to the folks that are tuned in that remember to be kind to yourself. I, I feel like especially now um, with th things being so accessible, we get kind of lost in this whole hustle mentality. And I feel like that can also be toxic where, you know, we're, we're draining ourselves to a certain point where we're, we've exhausted ourselves, not just physically, but also mentally. Rem remember, re just a reminder to remember that um, we also need to learn how to uh, learn and appreciate how to rest. Definitely. We live in a society that rewards you for exhausting yourself and how much work you can put in but that doesn't necessarily make it right <laughs> like we that's some like enjoying a good barbecue with your friends um and taking a day off is just as helpful and definitely just as healthy for your for your mental health as well um yep. i agree full full heartedly we're gonna be running sh a little um low on time so i just want to encourage anybody who has any last questions to throw them in the chat um, and I want to give you an opportunity to what what's next, what's coming, what's next, what can we look forward to on the horizon? Um, anything that's not redacted that you can't say, don't worry about it. But what can what can we be on the lookout for? So what's next for me, first and foremost, is uh, my sophomore album. This has been in the works since uh, the end of 2019. Um, so just kind of to give a, a context of what it's going to sound like is. Um, I, I want, I'm a big fan. I'm a big J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar fan. And um, I remember when the Dreamville compilation came out where they invited a bunch of artists. They also released a uh, docufilm on YouTube. For, for the folks that haven't watched it, I, I definitely highly suggest that y'all go on YouTube and um, search Dreamville uh, documentary. And it's the, they're behind the scenes of how, um, you know, they, they created this, uh, this, this, album together with various artists and in, in that docufilm what I saw was the J. Cole had a house and artists I think it was like for in a two-week span artists were just in and out creating music laying down vocals and I wanted to have I wanted to create an atmosphere similar to that so what I've been doing for the last year um, it kind of stopped because of COVID but what I was doing um, starting at the end of 2019 was I would rent Airbnbs in Los Angeles and also here in San Francisco and I would invite my bandmates and other musicians that I knew and we would just we would just host jam sessions for an entire weekend everybody would just sleep there and um, what this album is is a culmination of all of those um, uh, live sessions that we had together so all of the instrumentals were produced during those sessions and um, the only thing that I can say about this album for now is it's definitely a growth from Circa 91. Um, there's a lot more musicality in it, um, a lot more um, freedom for me to kind of experiment with the sound, but the, the lyricism and the, the thematic um, approach is still going to be there. So just imagine a more mature sounding Circa 91 is, is, is I guess, the, the best way to describe it. And in addition to the, the sophomore album, I released a docufilm called 7,000 Miles Homecoming um, last October. Um, we premiered it here in San Francisco uh, last year um, for Filipino American History Month. And it follows me and my band during that trip to the Philippines that I mentioned earlier. So it was our five day trip to the Philippines. And it's not only a behind the scenes um, look at uh, traveling musicians, but it's also a docufilm that explores the questions of what does it mean to be Filipino American? What does it mean to be an immigrant 
and what are my responsibilities of being a Filipino and how can I help bridge that gap between, you know, um, my communities here, my communities back home. And so what we're looking forward to doing is to bring this docufilm to different universities. So we'll be hosting screenings, whether virtually or hopefully in person um, soon when it's safe. And hopefully crossing my fingers, it'll, it'll be available for streaming at, um, at home coming soon. That's awesome. We're going to be on the lookout for all those things. We just put the trailer for the documentary, the Vimeo link into the chat on Twitch. So make sure you check it out there. That sounds really, really cool. J. Cole's um, a proud hero of ours out here. Hopefully we can get you out here for Dreamville Festival once, once that gets up and going again. That'd be really, really fun. The Filipino group at State um, is offering to give you a tour of Raleigh whenever you come out here. They would love to show you around and they're inviting you to their Lola's Coffee House open mic. Um, I'll connect the two of you together for that because I think yes, that'd be awesome. Yes, let's make that happen. Yes. Well, we wish you the best. I'm gonna give it a couple more second, couple more minutes in the chat for any last questions. But I just wanna say thank you again. Your story is so amazing. Your music, your art is really incredible. It's inspiring and we can't wait to see what's next and we're rooting for you. Um, where can people find you? For people that want to check out more of my music, I am available on all social media platforms. That's YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and also this dope app that I want to promote called Kumu um, at Ruby Ibarra. That's R-U-B-Y-I-B-A-R-R-A. But I'm also um, I stay I try to stay up to date on my website, rubyabarra.com for any upcoming gigs. Definitely. We have a couple questions coming in. Um... Can you speak more on your experience with spoken word and how that pipeline to rap and if you still write spoken word? I, um, I'll answer the second question um, in that first. Um, I, still, I do still write spoken word. I'm actually planning to incorporate more spoken word on uh, the sophomore album. Um, so you guys are going to be able to hear that when it comes out. Um, as far as my history with spoken word poetry, um, again, it was that drama class, um, you know, shout out to, to my, my drama teacher in high school, Miss, Miss Daly. She really, I feel, helped me come into my own as a performer because not only um, did she, through, through, you know, through, through that assignment, um, pretty much allow me to do my first live performance, um, you know, at that, at that age. But um, one, one time when we were in class, I remember we were in the middle of, um, we were writing some sort of prompt. And then all of a sudden, one person stands up and starts spitting. And then another person stands up and, and, and starts saying their verse. And it didn't dawn on me at the time that what, what these poets were doing was they were spitting a griot and they were doing a collective poem together. And they all met up on, in the center of, of the class together. And I remember, you know, 15 year old me watching this happen right before my eyes I had never seen anything like that before. And at that point, I didn't even know what spoken word was either. I just, I was just aware of um, poetry. I just knew of like uh, the rose that grew from concrete and I had read Shel Silverstein's books. That's all, that was all my knowledge of poetry. So seeing live performance poetry for the first time, I was just like, like my mind was just completely blown sitting there in my chair. I was like, who are these people? Where can I see more of this? I remember um, when I got home, the first thing that I did was I Googled um, Youth Speaks and that was the, the, the group that they were a part of and Brave New Voices, Deaf Poetry Jam. I just fell into this rabbit hole and I watched every single video that I could from Deaf Poetry Jam. And you know, from there that inspired me to wanna, to wanna write. And eventually once I went to UC Davis, I joined the Spoken Word Collective there on campus. And I think ultimately what Spoken Word helped me with was um, it helped me to evoke emotion during my performances, but also helped me to be a better writer. So I think, you know, I think spoken word and hip hop do go hand in hand, where um, ultimately one is kind of just like the more the acapella version form of the other. Because um, when we really think about, you know, hip hop, and especially when we think about artists like Kendrick Lamar or Tupac or even Lauryn Hill, if you just read the lyrics in, in these artists songs, that's poetry, that's spoken word, that's storytelling. And um, that's, I think, as being both a spoken word poet and a, an MC at the same time, I feel like um, having that experience um, in, in being involved in SLAM, being involved at these open mics, that all helped me grow as an MC. 
Definitely. And to any of you students out there, this might have been a little bit before your time, but Deaf Poetry Jam, you can find them on YouTube. You can find the DVDs on Amazon. They're probably live streamed somewhere. There's an old HBO segment, I think put on by Russell from Deaf Jam back in the day. And it's incredible. Some of the best spoken word, some artists like most Def and Kanye when they were really young, it's like one of their first times on stage. So definitely check out that series if you're into spoken word. It's absolutely incredible. And check out some of the other groups that Ruby mentioned, because I'm sure there's a lot of new people doing really amazing things as well. Um, there's a bunch of praise in the chat. Everyone just saying thank you. Thank you for your time um, and appreciate your knowledge. So oh, thank, thank you. you so thank you once again, Ruby. Thank you, Alex. And you can stay on, but we're going to end the end the Twitch. So you just say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for Bye, joining everyone. us. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for